Imagine holding a living direwolf puppy in your hands. That sounds like fantasy, right? Well, it's now become reality, thanks to genetic engineering. Yes, direwolves aren't just from Game of Thrones. These were very real ancient predators, and scientists have successfully revived them. All that and more, these are extinct animals scientists brought back from the afterlife. So guess what? Scientists just brought back the dire wolf. Yes, the actual creature. This is not something they're close to doing. They've actually done it. Colossal Biosciences, a Dallas-based biotech company, announced that they've successfully used ancient DNA to create three dire wolf puppies. CEO Ben Lamb said, our team took DNA from a 13,000-year-old tooth and a 72,000-year-old skull and made healthy dire wolf puppies. He also added, it was once said any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Well, today our team gets to unveil some of the magic they are working on. So two of the pups are named Romulus and Remus. The third was named Khaleesi, of course, a nod to Game of Thrones, which features dire wolves. In fact, George R. R. Martin, the author of Game of Thrones, actually got to hold one of these pups. How nuts would that be? You write a fantasy novel with these long extinct creatures in them, and then decades later, you actually get to hold a real living one. I don't think any goal I can imagine is ever going to live up to that. So these pups aren't clones. They're actually genetically engineered to be as close to dire wolves as science can get. They were born from surrogate dogs and raised with bottle feedings, so they're friendly for now, but they're already starting to act more like true wolves. Thankfully, they live on a massive 2,000 acre preserve with cameras, drones, and guards keeping an eye on them. The Bucardo, or a Pyrenean Ibex, if you're feeling fancy, was a wild mountain goat that went extinct in 2000 when the last known female named Celia was found squished under a fallen tree in Spain. Brutal way to go, honestly, but science wasn't ready to let her go just yet. In 2003, researchers went to Jurassic Park on the situation and they took frozen skin samples from Celia, using them to create a clone. And it worked, sort of. A domestic goat was used as the surrogate mom and against all odds, a cloned baby Ibex was born. Born. It was the first time an extinct animal had been brought back to life. The victory party didn't last long though. The clone only lived for about seven minutes. It had a severe lung defect and couldn't breathe properly. So technically, the Pyrenean Ibex became the first animal to go extinct twice. Kind of amazing and kind of heartbreaking. Even though the success was short-lived though, it proved that de-extinction wasn't just science fiction anymore. It was messy and complicated, sure, but it was real and a real possibility to do better. And in those seven minutes, the seemingly impossible actually happened. So pronounce something like Shavalsky. Uh, Shavalsky's horse is a prehistoric looking beast that once roamed the steppes of Central Asia. These stocky horses are the last truly wild horse species on earth. Not wild as in used to be tame and then went rogue, wild as in never domesticated. But things didn't go well for them once humans showed up with fences and firearms. By the late 60s, these horses were completely extinct in the wild. The only ones left were in zoos, but in 2020, scientists stepped in. Using 40-year-old frozen cells from a stallion named Kaporovic, they created a clone, and boom, you had a healthy baby Shavalsky's horse, now born in a Texas facility, who they named Kurt. Kurt's genes came from a bloodline that hadn't been part of the breeding pool in decades, so he brought much needed diversity to a population that was getting a little too inbred. And thanks to years of conservation work, these wild horses are back in their native Mongolia, running free once again. The quagga was a strange looking animal, a zebra subspecies with stripes in the front half of its body and then just a plain brown rear end. It once lived in the grasslands of South Africa, roaming around in large herds. But like a bunch of species, it didn't survive European colonization. Settlers hunted it for meat and hides, and by the 1880s, it was declared extinct. The last known quagga died in captivity in Amsterdam in 1883. For a long time, scientists didn't even realize the quagga was a distinct subspecies. That changed in the 1980s, though, when a German natural historian named Reinhold Rau launched the quagga project. Using preserved skins and taxidermy specimens, Rao conducted genetic testing and confirmed that the quagga was genetically close enough to plain zebras that selective breeding might be able to bring them back, at least in appearance. The idea was to breed plain zebras that naturally showed fewer stripes. 
generation after generation until the animals started to resemble the extinct quagga. Over the decades, the project produced zebras with lighter coats, reduced striping, and even that same body shape described in old quagga records. The animals born from this project are now called Rao quaggas. And sure, they aren't true quaggas in the genetic sense, but they're close. Some have even been reintroduced into the environment in South Africa, living in the same type of environment their ancestors did. The Lord Howe Island stick insect was once believed to be extinct, wiped out by invasive rats and other pests. The insect, also known as the tree lobster for its very weird lobster looking appearance, lived on Lord Howe Island in the Pacific Ocean. By the 1920s, the insect had completely disappeared though, or so everyone thought. For decades, it was assumed that the rats had done them in. But then, in 2001, there was this incredible discovery. Researchers came across a population of these thought to be extinct insects surviving on Ball's Pyramid, a jagged, steep rock formation off the coast of Lord Howe Island. And the fact that these things managed to hang on in such a harsh, isolated environment was mind-blowing, as well as the fact that they were even there at all. So now, scientists have been working hard to breed them in captivity and reintroduce them to their original island home. And they're slowly making a comeback. The Rastradora Basilero is a hunting dog that was bred in the 1950s to chase down jaguars and wild pigs in Brazil's thick forests. But by 1973, the poor dogs got hit with tick-borne diseases and a bunch of insecticide poisoning to try and get rid of the pests. Well, this was enough to wipe them out, and they were officially declared extinct. In the early 2000s, though, a group of dog lovers and breeders formed a group called the Brazilian Tracker Rescue Support Group. They set out to find any surviving dogs that had the original breed's traits in them. They spent years tracking down these dogs, selectively breeding them, and by 2013, they'd successfully brought the breed back from extinction. The Floriana giant tortoise lived on Floriana Island in the Galapagos. As the name suggests, these were huge tortoises, about four and a half feet long. Sadly, by the 1800s, they were wiped out, mostly thanks to overhunting by sailors and the introduction of invasive species. And for over a century, everyone thought they were totally gone. But in 2012, scientists discovered that there might be some hope after all. They found a female tortoise on another island. Espanola that had DNA showing she was related to the Floriana tortoises. This tortoise was nicknamed Lonesome George's cousin. And scientists went to work on a plan. They started breeding her with tortoises that were genetically close enough, and thanks to years of careful breeding, they managed to create a population of tortoises that closely resembled the extinct Floriana giant tortoises. It wasn't a perfect clone job, but it was close enough to bring these species back in a new form. So while we don't have the extinct Floriana giant tortoise wandering around exactly, it's still better than nothing. Okay, now here's one you probably haven't heard of, the Montreal melon. So this is a type of melon that was native to Montreal, obviously, and used to grow in the area back in the 1800s. The melon had a very unique flavor. It's been described as having a slight spice to it, almost like nutmeg, and apparently it would just melt in your mouth when eating it. No surprise, it was a local favorite. But this melon pretty much disappeared in the early 1900s. No one really knows exactly why. Maybe it was due to disease or just the change farming practices at the time, but whatever the case, the Montreal melon was gone. For over a century, it was nothing but a legend. But in 1996, seeds were discovered at a seed bank in, try and guess where, I'll give you a second, that's right, Iowa. Well, soon enough, the Montreal melon was back on local menus. The York groundsel was a little yellow flower that was hanging on in some pretty unusual places in York, England. It was a cross between two other plants and would grow in strange areas like railway sidings and roadways. But like many things in the world of nature, it didn't stand a chance once the city decided to crack down on weeds. By 1991, the flower was officially declared extinct in the wild. But just because it was gone doesn't mean people gave up on it. Turns out, there were seeds stored in the Millennium Seed Bank, a place where scientists keep seeds from all sorts of plants for situations just like this. In 2023, experts from Natural England decided to give the flower a second shot at life. Using those stored seeds, they managed to grow the York groundsel back to life, making this the first ever successful de-extinction in Britain. Now the plants are being reintroduced and it's a major win for conservation, proving that with a little help from science, you can sometimes bring back what was thought to be lost forever. So sure, it's not an animal, 
but still a living thing, and uh, that's pretty cool. The coelacanth is probably one of the most famous rediscovered animals in the world. For centuries, scientists thought that the coelacanth was long extinct, way back since the end of the Cretaceous period, around 66 million years ago. But in 1938, something that could only be described as mind-blowing happened. A fisherman off the coast of South Africa caught this unusual fish, and after scientists carefully examined it, they were amazed to find that this was a coelacanth, a fish that was supposed to have been gone for millions of years was still out there swimming in the ocean, and since then, scientists have tracked down several other coelacanths in the waters around Africa and Indonesia, proving that this ancient creature somehow survived the mass extinctions. So yeah, this one isn't technically de-extinct, just rediscovered, still though, does make you wonder what other seemingly extinct animals may actually still be out there. With all that said, I've been your host James, I'll catch you, yeah, you specifically, in the next video.